So we're looking at Joshua, and uh, if you want to turn there with me, um, <clears throat> lots of profound, fascinating things in Joshua. So we'll just kick it off. Joshua was probably um, about 1,400 years before Christ, so it was probably written between 1,400 and 1,350. And this time period coincides with the golden days of Egypt, which is uh, very well published. So the golden days of Egypt are happening. King Tut, if you guys remember King Tut, he lived in 1300, so not too far away from the same time. It's interesting that there are some Egyptian documents in this time that speak of Canaan was Egyptian territory. Egyptian was the world power. Egypt was the world power at the time. And there are Egyptian documents that talk about the takeover of Canaan. So it's fascinating that we have extra biblical documents that talk about what's happening because Canaan is writing Egypt saying, you need to come help us because we're being taken over. And Egypt says, we're not going to come up there. The Armana letters, that's what that is. The Armana letters. And they mention uh, a couple of the tribes of, of Israel. Uh, some of the miracles, holding back the Jordan River so they cross on dry ground the same way Moses did. The walls of Jericho are going to fall down. Uh, Israel is going to win victories because God rains down hailstones and kills the enemy with hail. And if you remember, Joshua stops time during one of the wars. Uh, so let's just kick it off because there's so many cool things. We'll just look at them as we get to them. Chapter, the first section, uh, it really helps to look at your sections. We're going to enter Canaan land because we're on the other side. We're in the town of Moab looking across the Jordan at the promised land. So we're going to enter Canaan land. Then they're going to start conquering all of Canaan land. Then after they've conquered the land, Joshua is going to divide it up and give all the tribes of Israel their pieces of land. Joshua is going to have, this is a very critical section, guys. If anything, this is the section I want to co uh, cover the most. When Joshua divides up the land in chapter 21, the text says God fulfilled all of the promises which he gave to Israel. That is super important nowadays where you have dispensational beliefs. Dispensational beliefs is um, certain theologies that believe that God still has to fulfill promises to Israel. So Israel over in the Middle East still needs to be given back to Israel and God needs to keep his promises to them. That's a bad understanding because the promises were fulfilled here in Joshua and it's going to be very clear to us. So that's important. Joshua gives uh, two final speeches, chapter 22 and 23, and then God spends one chapter summarizing what's happened from Abraham all the way through Joshua. So there's your summary right there. And again, he again says, I've promised everything that I gave to Abraham. So let's cover some of them. The part one, entering Canaan land, chapters one through five. Chapter one, you need to obey the commandments. We'll look at chapter one and verse five. <clears throat> and I would circle, if you like writing in your Bibles, I would circle verse five and six. Chapter one, verse five and six, I'd circle that whole section. And right next to it, um, write Joshua 23, 14. Joshua 23, 14. So let's read this. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers. Okay? And that's fulfilled in Joshua 23, 14. If you keep going, um, we are sent back to the book of Deuteronomy. So if you want to circle verse 8, circle verse 8, and then next to that write Deuteronomy 17, 18 through 20. Joseph, or, uh, yeah, Joseph is upholding the same things that Moses said. So here it is, verse 8. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. But you shall meditate on it day and night. Meditate on the scriptures day and night, is what he told them. So that you may be careful to do according to all that is written, for in them you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Very important, God, uh, guys, is the covenant relationship. The covenant relationship is God saying, I will bless you beyond your wildest dreams 
as long as you meditate on the law and obey it and do my commandments. The other option is if you break the covenant, I break my promises as well. Super important through all of these books, guys, and uh, good to have that in memory. Chapter 2, they go in and start taking some of the land, and the main story in chapter 2 is going to be Rahab. Rahab, and um, in chapter 2, I would circle verse 11, put a big circle around verse 11, and I would write Deuteronomy 30, verse 11, right next to that. Deuteronomy 30 and 11, and I'll tell you how this all comes together. So Rahab, uh, in verse 9, said to them, I know that the Lord has given you the land. Now pay attention how this Canaanite woman is recognizing what's going on when Israel comes to invade. She says, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen over all of us so that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. We have heard, she says, we have heard, so news has been traveling. We have heard how the Lord dried up the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings, the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, Sihon and Og, uh, who you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you for the Lord your God, he is the true God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now Rahab, we'll go into her just a little bit in just a moment here. I think I'm going to save her. But the reason I had you go to Deuteronomy 30 and verse 11, it says there, and the message is not too far away from you. It is in your heart and it is on your mouth. That's how people were going to be saved. And Rahab is a great example of how that happens. Rahab heard about the God of the Israelites, believed in the God of the Israelites, confessed in the God of the Israelites, and they didn't destroy her. So we're going to come back to that story, okay? Rahab becomes very important in the history of Israel. James writes how about important Rahab's faith was. In Matthew chapter 1, Matthew is going to list Rahab. She marries into the Israelite family, and Joseph, Mary, Jesus, and David all come from the lineage of Rahab. Very interesting stuff. Uh, chapters 3 and 4, they enter Canaan. Joshua parts the Jordan. Chapter 5 is an interesting story. Chapter 5 is the angelic commander of God, and... Uh, Let's just draw attention to chapter verse 13 and verse 14. The angelic commander of God, okay, this is a spiritual being. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him, and pay attention what he asks and what the answer is, okay? Joshua asked this guy, are you for us or are you for our adversaries? And the angel answers, no. The angel says, no. No, which no, which question do you say no to? Exactly, right? And this is fascinating. This is theology, guys. I am the commander of the Lord, and I have come. Uh, let's see. Further, what does my Lord say to his servant? Uh, take off your sandals from your feet, the place where you're standing. 13, 14, 15. Yeah, chapter 5, 13, 14, and 15. So here, here's the, the, the little piece of theology that we should get from this, guys. Are you for us or are you for them? And the angel says, no. I'm the, I'm the army of the Lord. And so basically what he's saying is, if you get on my side, I don't get on your side. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And that's the call of God. God calls to save people, but he calls and says, you get on my program. I don't join your program. You join my program. In today's world, there's this seeker-friendly attitude, and I don't want to go too deep into that, but it's always God that uh, wants you, so to speak. God is reaching out to you. God wants to be on your team. God wants to be your cheerleader, so to speak. And it's texts like this that say, hey, let's give God his proper place. God is God, 
And if you want to be right with him, you get on God's team. Don't expect God to get on your team. Just my way of thinking, that's a big deal. So the angelic army sa- angel says, uh, you figure out which team you're going to be on. That's the end, chapter 5. So now we're going to go in. Who was this guy anyway? Uh, he was like an angelic uh, soldier of God. And he's going to go in and he's going to fight the battles. He's the one who's going to fight the battles for him. Yeah. Most of the battles we're going to see, most of the battles, we'll read about it in a minute, but God wins the battles. The, the, the Israelites don't fight very much. They do, but God is the one that wins the battles, and we'll look at that. The next section, conquering the land. Now we're going to talk about wars. This is going to be section chapters 6 through 12. And um, here again, here's an important theological point. Uh, we want to contrast the battle of Jericho, which is in chapter 6, with the battle of Ai, which is chapters 7 and 8. And basically, the battle of Jericho shows what happens when Israel is obedient. God told Israel, march around the city for seven days, seven priests. On the seventh day, seven trumpets, blow the trumpets seven times. You see like several rows of sevens. Seven priests, seven days, seven times around the city, seven trumpets. That's kind of interesting because Revelation is written the same way. Lots of sevens. So the Battle of Jericho, we know on the seventh day when they blew the horns, the walls fell down and they had victory. Basically, God wins it for them. So the Battle of Jericho shows what happens when Israel is obedient. We've got another battle that comes up next, the Battle of Ai. The Battle of Ai is chapter 7 through 8. And um, one of the commanders of Israel that goes in to fight is Achan. And Achan does something that is evil before the Lord. We're going to read uh, chapter 7 and verse 20. Chapter 7 and verse 20. Achan answered Joshua, truly I have sinned, because they were losing the battle. And they needed to figure out what was wrong. I have sinned against the Lord God. This is what I did. When I saw amongst the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar. Uh, I want to say Shinar, guys. I want to say that was Babylon. I, I, I'm not sure yes. if that's... Yes? Oh, Shinar awesome. Babylon. Very good. Shinar is the old name for Babylon. So this beautiful cloak from Shinar, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels. Now pay attention how sin happens in this guy's mind. I saw it. I coveted it. I took it, and I hid it. There's there's a lesson just right there. Sin in life. I saw it, I wanted it, I took it, and then I hid it. We could make a whole sermon on that. Um, So Achan steals, lies. Israel loses. Achan is taken out and stoned with stones, and they lose the battle. There's the nature of the covenant relationship. In the battle of Jericho, when Israel was obedient, God gave them victory. In the battle of Ai, when people of Israel were sinful and did wrong, God calls them to lose. And that's the nature of covenant relationship. You win as long as you're obedient. When you become disobedient, you lose. Um, I want to remind you of something uh, that we did in Numbers chapter 15. God had tried to teach Israel your problem is your heart and your eyes. You remember, it said, don't trust your heart, don't trust your eyes, because you will whore after them. Rough, that's rated R language. So I'll take you back to Numbers 15, and I'll just read this to you to remind them. Numbers 15, God already equipped them to avoid this sin that Achan performed. Numbers 15 and verse 37. Um, In fact, right next to Joshua 7, probably 20 20 and 21, if you want to circle, Joshua 7, 20 and 21. And then right to the side of that, Numbers 15, 37 through 39. Numbers 15, 37 through 39, they should have remembered this. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the people of Israel and tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments. Who remembers reading that when we did? Yeah. Make tassels on the corners of your gardens. Throughout your generations, put a cord of blue on the tassel of each corner, and this tassel shall be for you to look at 
and remember the Lord's commandments to do them. Do not follow after your own heart or your own eyes because you are inclined to whore after them. So Achan dies here. What's interesting is this is the only battle where God says, don't take anything. The battle of Ai is the only battle. God said, don't take anything. God was testing Israel to see if they would be faithful to him. We're going to see later on in the, in the rest of the battles, God lets them take all the plunder they want, and Israel becomes rich beyond their wildest dreams. All Achan had to do was obey for one battle, and God would have made him rich beyond his wildest dreams. Powerful story. Okay, uh, I want to compare Rahab with Achan, and this has to do, this is an important theological event, guys. Uh, and this has to do with Romans chapter 9 as well, but I don't know if that's too much to tie together. So here's the deal. Who is the true Israel? Right? Nowadays, there's still this idea with some people that God is, needs to restore Israel. And God had made promises to Israel, but the question is, who is the true Israel? In Romans 9, Paul asks the question, they are not all Israel who are Israel. And neither are they born of Israel who are Israel. There's this thing about who is the true Israel. And here is how we're going to do this. Um, the true Israel has to do with a covenant relationship. And we're going to compare Rahab with Achan. Okay? Rahab. Let me go over her. Rahab was one of the Canaanites in a Canaanite city, and she was doomed for destruction. God said, go in and destroy them all. A vessel of destruction. She's a pagan. She was a female, which was the underprivileged gender, since that was a patriarchal society. And she was a prostitute, and she was of no importance. Okay, that's Rahab. Not a child of the promise, right? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not a child of the promise. She's a Canaanite that's supposed to be destroyed. Let's look at Achan. Achan is the one that went in and took stuff he wasn't supposed to take. Here's Achan. Achan was an Israelite from the favored tribe of Judah. Same tribe as Christ. He was noble. He was wealthy. He was a warrior. He was especially chosen amongst 3,000 men to go in and fight this battle of Ai. He was an honored Israelite. And he was on his way to the promised land. Okay, we get the, the picture. In a stunning reversal, <clears throat> Rahab becomes a full member of the people of God. And Achan, who was a full member, is killed and stoned as though he were a pagan Canaanite. So there is a switch that happens here where the person that was supposed to be destroyed a prostitute, a Canaanite, because she had heard of the God of Israel. And she said, and we know that your God is the true God of heaven. She believed in him with her heart, confessed her with his mouth, and she was saved and brought in to become true Israel, one of the sons of Israel. Somebody who actually was a favored son of Israel, Achan, rebels and sins like he wasn't supposed to, is cast out, is stoned, and he's treated like the pagan nations. So the theology there is covenant relationship. The person who will love God and obey God is the true Israel, whether or not they're an Israelite or not. A true Israelite who doesn't love God and doesn't obey God is like the wicked child, the child of the slave woman, the child that's not included in the promise. <clears throat> That's important theology there. Okay, so they go in and they're taking over the rest of the land. Chapters 9 through 12, there's another example of this switch. The Gibeonites, I won't go through that one. The Gibeonites is another uh, sect of people that should be destroyed. God said go in and destroy them. That's a complicated story because they come into Israel and they lie about who they are. But they want to ally with Israel because they know the God of Israel is going to destroy them. So they ally with Israel, 
and then they too are saved and become part of Israel. Okay, so the Gibeonite story is an interesting one, a little bit more complicated, but people who are not Israel became Israel because they humbled themselves before the God of Israel. Other Canaanite kings, we go to chapter 10 and chapter 11. Chapter 10 is very interesting. You might want to mark uh, Joshua 10, 11. Joshua 10, 11. Joshua 10, 11 lets us know that God is the one that is winning the victories for Israel. It says something to the effect that God sent large hailstones, and the hailstones ended up killing the enemies, and the hailstones killed more enemies than those that died by the sword. Is that the right? Are they stones or hailstones? Hailstones. I stones. Yeah. They all got stoned. Not... <laughs> stones from heaven. <laughs> Okay, so there's a, a fantastic example of God winning the war. Yeah, they went out and fought. Yes, they had swords. Yes, they killed a few people. But the scripture lets us know God killed way more people than the Israelites. So he is, he is giving them the promised land. Interesting about uh, the hailstones killing the people. Revelation 16 has a story about God sending hailstones to kill the people. And you need to understand Joshua in order to understand Revelation. That's pretty fascinating guys um, so that's chapter 10 is the hailstone story chapter 11 um, there's a hardening of the heart and I wanted to bring this up because this has to do with theology as well um, I don't know if I already wrote that down somewhere shoot okay well let me just cover this um, Joshua chapter 11 and verse 20 it was the Lord's doing Joshua eleven twenty. It was the Lord's doing to harden their hearts so that they should come against Israel in battle in order that they should be devoted to destruction, should receive no mercy, should be destroyed, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Um, important theology there because that's one of those verses that says God hardens men's hearts and doesn't let them respond. And of course, that's difficult to deal with today. Does God harden people's hearts or does he not? So we want to understand that theology. Let me give you a little explanation. And if it's still not clear, then please ask the question, because this is very healthy for us. Why so much death and why so much genocide? When God has Israel go in and destroy all these Canaanite nations, I believe there's over 50 villages and cities that they just obliterate. And there are the atheists that will use Joshua and say God is a horrible, tyrant, genocidal murderer. They paint this horrible picture of God. And if you don't know much about him, this looks pretty brutal, doesn't it? A lot of people are dying. So um, let's look at this. Uh, somewhere in here, let me see. I was going to have you guys write it down, but uh, let's look back at Genesis chapter 15, guys. Uh, and let me tell you the, the background of this story. So right now we're in Canaan and they're destroying Canaan. <clears throat> but is there any justice to what's happening here? Okay. If we go back to Genesis, uh, in Genesis 14 and 15, God is talking to Abraham. And what's happening in 14 and 15 is Sodom and Gomorrah, evil cities, have allied with other people. And they are going to war against the Amalekites, against the Canaanites. So evil people are fighting evil people. In the mix of that, do you remember Abraham had a relative that was in Sodom and Gomorrah? Huh? His nephew Lot. In the mix of this war, Lot gets taken captive and gets taken away. So this brings Abraham to the scene. Abraham goes and starts fighting in this war and gets his brother Lot back. But this makes Abraham fight against the Amalekites. Okay? So this war that we're seeing right now in Joshua already started 400 years earlier in Genesis 14 and 15. Let's go to Genesis 15. Go to Genesis 15 and 16. When, when Abraham wants to go ahead and start war and take out the Canaanites, God tells Abraham not to. I don't want you to go in and kill these people yet. Let's see what he says to Abraham. Genesis 15 and verse 16. 
He tells Abraham, they will come back here in the... Well, we should read more than that. Genesis 15. Okay. 14 and 15. Um, why don't we start around 12, 15 and 12, okay? So right, right above chapter 15, guys, I would write Joshua 23, 14. Chapter 15 is going to be fulfilled in Joshua 23, 14 and Joshua 21, 42. So right, around, right above chapter 15 in Genesis, I would put that. Joshua 23, 14. 2142, because what God tells Abraham here in 15 is actually going to get fulfilled in Joshua. So here we go, right around verse 13, chapter 15 and verse 13. Then the Lord said to Abram, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs. They will be servants there and they will be afflicted for 400 years. Where is he talking about? They were in Egypt. That's right. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and after that they will come out with great possessions. How did uh, Israel come out of Egypt with great possessions? They pretty much gave them to them to get them out of there. There you go. The, pl away. the plagues and the death of the firstborn was so severe that the Egyptians gave them gold and wealth and stuff to get out of there. So that's a fulfillment of what God promised Abraham. They will come out with great possessions. As for you, Abraham, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. And then they will come back here. Now keep in mind he's in Samaria, or at least right in that area. They will come back here in the fourth generation because the iniquity of the Amorites, that is the Canaanites. They will come back here because the iniquity of the Canaanites is not yet complete. So when we get to Joshua, 400 years after Abraham, and people go, how could God be so cruel to kill all those people? You need to remember, God, Abraham wanted to wipe them out in Genesis. And God says, nope, we're going to wait 400 years. 400 years for them to repent, because their sin is not bad enough for me to wipe them out just yet. Okay? So when God, the scripture says God hardens a heart, we always have to keep in mind, at some point, he has given the people enough time to repent. In this case, 400 years. Um, then in verse 19, he tells them all the lands he's going to give them. Canaanites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, Jebusites. All of that stuff is Joshua chapter 23. Um... So he gave the Canaanites 400 years to repent. Now in Joshua, they're going to go in and, and slaughter them. What is the problem with the Canaanites? Um, somewhere, maybe back in Joshua. Yeah, I'll get you back to Joshua and I'll give you these verses. What was the problem with the Canaanites? They, they Baal or yes. What did they do to Baal? What did they do to Baal? They, kid, they killed their kids. And they burned their children, yeah. sacrificing them to Baal. So the first one is going to be Leviticus 18, 24. I'll give you these, and I'll tell you where to put them in Joshua. We're going to find out what, what, it, what was it about the Canaanites that they were so depraved. Leviticus 18, 24, and we looked at this. They um, do not make yourselves unclean by any of the things that these nations do that I'm driving out before you. They have become unclean. The land has become unclean. So I must punish its iniquity, and the land will vomit out its inhabitants. When you read Leviticus 18, it talks about the sins of the Canaanites, all kinds of sexual immorality, incest, people marrying their mothers, um, bestiality. The sin of these people had reached a point after 400 years that God had to do something about it. And that's good to understand. These people will reprobate beyond repair, like Sodom and Gomorrah. That was one hint we see in Leviticus. In Deuteronomy uh, is where we see that they were offering their children to the god Molech, burning their children alive. So they had gotten reprobate, and there was no turning back. So that is why 
God is justified in doing the holy war where he takes out these people. Um, what's interesting is God is fair. When God says that the land will vomit out anybody that's evil, in 700 years, the Israelites are going to become so evil, they're going to be sacrificing their children to the stars, and they're going to be committing sexual immorality right in God's temple. And so what does God do after 700 years to the Israelites? Babylon comes in, takes them out of the land, and exiles them. Because remember, where God's presence is has to be holy. There can be no sin where God's presence is. So God brings Israel into his presence. And then later on, after 700 years, when they're doing the same thing the Canaanites were doing, he kicks them out of his land because you've got to be holy if you're going to be by me. Fascinating stuff how all that comes together, guys. Um, so if you go back to Joshua chapter 11, I would write that right, right above Joshua chapter 11. I would write those two verses. Put uh, above Joshua 11, write Leviticus 18 and Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 12. And that will remind you why they needed to go in and destroy uh, Canaan. Chapter 13 through 21, they've uh, conquered all the land. And in 13 through 21, Joshua divides up all the land. Um, I'm just going to basically jump right to 21, chapter 21. And uh, this is going to be critical theological information. We're going to look at Joshua 21, verse 42. Joshua 21, 42. These cities each had its pasture land around it, so it was with all the cities. Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to give to their fathers. They went in and took possession of it, and they settled there. And the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he swore to their fathers. You might want to underline this. Not, oh, no, 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 not this one. Not one of all their enemies withstood them because the Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. And then word 45 is what I would circle. 45, not one word of all the good promises that the Lord made to the house of Israel had failed. Everything, what? Everything was fulfilled. All of the promises that God had made to Abraham and his children and Israel, in chapter 21 of Joshua, everything is fulfilled. That's important stuff today because of the dispensational idea that uh, Israel is going to once again come back to life and God's going to bless it. Uh, Joshua, God already fulfilled his promise Okay, 21 there. I would circle that. That's a, and I put stars all around that. That's a massive, massive text right there. Joshua's final speech is in chapters 22 through 23. Uh, chapter 22 is speech number one. And Joshua takes them back to the same old, same old. Love God, obey his commandments. We've seen that in almost every one of the uh, early books here. So first speech, chapter 22, let's look at verse 5. Only be careful to observe the commandments and the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, keep his commandments, cling to him, serve him with all your heart and soul. That's the first speech. After that speech, notice 22 and verse 8. He dismisses them. He says, go back to your tents with much wealth, very much livestock, with much silver, much gold, much bronze, much iron, much clothing. Go and divide the spoil of your enemies with your brothers. So not only were they in their new homes, but they were wealthy. I, I Personally, I would circle that, put stars around that, because that's another part of the fulfillment of God's promises to Israel. He made them rich. Um, and this is where I said, look at how, how God blessed them. If Achan would have only obeyed God at the battle of Ai. <laughs> he, didn't need that stuff. he didn't need that little shirt and that little bar of gold. 
that looks so precious compared to this, right? Amazing. His second speech is in chapter 23. His second speech, he reiterates and he repeats and he reminds them God has done everything he promised to do. Uh, chapter 23 and verse 14. Um, 23 and 14. Now I'm about to go the way of the earth. Joshua is going to die. You know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one word of God has failed. Of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you, everything has come to pass. Not one of them has failed. Anytime the Bible repeats something, you better underline it because you know it's important. God had fulfilled all of his promises to Israel. Uh, chapter 24 is the last of the chapters, and this is basically God summarizing. Chapter 24 is a fascinating read because God summarizes for this generation everything he's done for Israel all the way from Abraham to now. So this is God's summary of everything that's happened. Chapter 24. A couple things I draw your attention to. Chapter 24 and verse 11. God reminds them that it was him that won the victories. 24 verse 11. You went over to the Jordan, you came to Jericho, and the leaders of Jericho fought against you, and also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, Hittites, Gigashites, Hivites, Jebusites. Remember that list that we read in uh, Genesis? Here it is all over again. And I gave them into your hand. I set the hornet before you which drove them out before you, the two kings of the Amorites, it was not by your sword, it was not by your bow. I gave you land on which you had not labored, cities that you did not build, and you dwelt in them. You ate the fruit of the vineyards, the olives and the orchards, things that you did not plant. God took them in and gave them everything. Um, yeah. Chapter 24, Joshua reminds them of something. Now, I, I want to draw your attention right before that to uh, Josephus. Josephus was a historian that lived at the time of Christ. I think it was 15 A.D. all the way to 100 A.D. was Josephus. So he was alive during the time of Christ. Jewish historian, he writes. Josephus writes this because he retells the things that Joshua did. And I want you to notice the difference between what Josephus writes down and what Joshua wrote down. Josephus 5, 125. Since God, who is the Father and Lord of the Hebrew nation, has now given you this land as a possession, and he promised to preserve us in the enjoyment of it as our own land forever. So Josephus says, God promised to let us have this land forever. Josephus, uh, it's so neat to read that because Josephus does the same mistake that the world has done since God demanded obedience. The world wants faith. The world wants a God. The world wants some kind of religion. People need that. What they don't like is to submit themselves to a real God. They don't like the accountability. That is why cults and false religions sprout, because they want this sensation of worshiping something without being accountable for their behavior. What Joseph does is he promises Israel, this is going to be our land forever. What do you think is the difference between what Josephus documents and what Joseph and Aaron and Moses and all the leaders told Israel. What's the difference? They told them that it was their supply that they obeyed the Lord. There you go. Moses, Aaron, the, the priests, Joseph, they all told Israel, you'll be blessed as long as you are obedient. Whenever you become un un disobedient, the, the land is going to spit you out the same way the land spit out the Canaanites. That's what the scripture says to Israel. God's children are accountable to him. It's a covenant relationship. 
And just like a marriage, when one person breaks the covenant, the covenant is off. So just uh, in light of that, Josephus does what the majority of cults and religions do, gives you all the promises with none of the accountability. So we're going to end uh, Joshua in chapter 24 and verse 20. After he's, this is one of the last things he's going to say. After he's given him everything, and then he's reminded him that he's given him everything, he lets him know the nature of the covenant. Jos, jo, Joshua 24, verse 20. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and he will do you harm, and he will consume you after he has done you good. The people said to Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. We will do good. We will be obedient. And Joshua said to the people, You then are a witness against yourself that you have chosen to serve the Lord. And the people agreed, Yes, we are witnesses. We promise to obey God. And that's the condition of the covenant. Uh, Just to bring it all to a head there, guys. um, Right there at the end of Joshua, I would give yourself a reference. Maybe it's at the top of Joshua 24 or anywhere in there. Give yourself a reference back to Genesis 15, chapter 15, 13 through 21. Uh, And I want you to see what Genesis 15, 13 through 21 says. So keep in mind, right, they've gone in, they've conquered, they've been given all the blessings, they inhabit Canaan, and it's 400 years or four generations after the promises to Abraham. So I'll read you Genesis 15. The Lord said to Abraham, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in the land that's not theirs. They'll be servants and they'll be afflicted for 400 years. I'll bring judgment on the nation they serve and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. You shall go to your fathers in peace and be married, buried at a good age. They will come back here in the fourth generation, 400 years from now. And the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down, got dark, blah, blah, blah. Verse 18. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I will give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river of the Euphrates, all the lands of all the people. And so Joshua draws to a close what God started with Abraham in the book of Genesis. Normally we think of the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. We need to add the next book, Joshua, because Joshua is where everything gets finished and everything gets done.